Berserk fans, it's, it's time. No, no, hold back your tears. It is time. We need to catch up with the current release of Berserk that is ongoing. And that means we're gonna start doing an entire deluxe edition every single video of Berserk until we're caught up. I am really sorry for missing these last two weeks. I had a wrist injury that just prevented me from being able to do any huge editing projects. But now that I'm feeling back at 100%, let's go ahead and get into some Berserk Deluxe Edition Volume 10. Where we had just left off, Guts had finally had a single good day. Yay! He was downright feeling as good as I felt when I handed in my final draft of my upcoming book, A Witch's Sin Neon Ghost. Always be plugging! Release date Q2 this year. But Deluxe Edition 10 picks up with Guts and Shriek walking at night on the beach together, both unable to sleep. And their conversation turns to Guts's observations about Shriek, where he says, You only distract yourself like that, so cleverly set in your own ways, worrying about everyone but yourself. I would never, if you keep that up now as a kid, you'll be old before your time. You needn't worry. When through death, we magic users part with the loved one, it carries a different meaning than for you of the physical world. To us who lived in both worlds, death is not an end, but an emergence into a new, a great existence. It, it, it's never... And we see Shriek is beginning to cry. Never cause for sadness. And she hugs Guts, and Guts allows her to embrace him. And Shriek's elf begins to tease her for having a crush on Guts, which is a kind of adorable subplot throughout this deluxe edition. But I didn't really think about the fact that, yeah, Shriek and Guts can obviously bond over the fact that while well, Shriek's childhood is not as dark and twisted as Guts, she's obviously having to deal with a lot more responsibility than any kid should. And so Guts can give a very clear and honest perspective of what going through that is like. And that is such a good way for these two characters Characters to bond, which made me start thinking about the fact that rarely this is true in fantasy. There's not a single person within this party I don't like being here. Even in One Piece, it took me a long time to become okay with Usopp and Brook is still awful. Just my correct opinion, you're allowed to have your wrong one. But then we see Sir Spooky arrive. Still surviving, huh? I could say the same for you. I've been owing you lots of favors lately. Not like that's new. So for now anyways, thanks. So what brings you here today? I doubt it's time to check on my recovery. Don't tell me that you're being here. Means that an apostle's nearby. Colors fade from the eyes. The tongue loses taste. Shivering plagues the fingertips. How did you know that? It's an omen. Each time you wear that armor and fight, as the Berserker, light, voice, warmth, you will come to lose many things. Thanks for the warning, but sorry, that ain't gonna happen. I'll never lose myself that way again. Next time, I'll show you I can handle this thing with temperance. And Shriek reaffirms this thing she'll be there to help him, before asking Sir Spooky, but beg your pardon, what kind of relationship did you have with my mistress? She claimed the berserker armor was very dangerous fetish and prudently applied a seal to it, yet she always gazed upon it, somewhat loggingly, and she asked if Sir Spooky ever wore it. You are quite shrewd, as I should expect, from the dearest student of the Witch of the Spirit Tree Forest. Indeed, that armor is something I once wore in the distant past, when we lived within the reason of time. And he's basically confirming something we've already kind of had stated to us, the readers, which is that, yes, him and the Witch of the Forest were kind of like the proto-guts, and I would say maybe Casca equivalent of the past, or maybe Casca shriek hybrid equivalent for the past. This is all about destiny and causality and cyclical nature of conflicts. Wheel of time. <laughs> but Sir Spooky descends into a warning. The Hawk has but one goal. You should know it better than anyone. He now exists beyond the reason of the physical world, where no one in the mortal realm can threaten him. It would be akin to someone in a story challenging the one who wrote it. It cannot be done. To stand and confront the Hawk, one must also exist outside the story. Then the reason my mistress was- All the more so as a powerful wielder of magic. He must have 
considered one witch to be more of an obstacle than a host of 10,000. If you continue on with your journey, you'll soon encounter the apostles again. And at that time, their commander will likely be the Hawk. To protect or to contend, you will continue to query your own soul. It's your fate as a man who stands in the interstice. However, I offer this hope. Elfhelm, the land you seek, the lord of the elves who sits there, is called the king. I'm not gonna try and pronounce that. Okay, fine, I'll try. King Hanafubuku. I think I did okay. With his powers at hand, it should be possible for your partner, for the branded girl, to regain her mind. You have my word. And here we see Guts go from the anger he was feeling at Griffith being mentioned to immediately flooded with some semblance of hope. But Sir Spooky leaves with a warning. There's no guarantee your wish will be her wish. And we cut to Casca, who's actually seeing a small child on the beach. And when the party finds Casca, we see she's holding the child. The party's confused where it might have come from, but they head back for the refuge for the night, taking the child with them for protection. We see Casca is immediately bonded to the child. It also comes towards Guts, but Casca tears the child from him. Guts, of course, thinks of the deformed offspring him and Casca created. The last I caught sight of him was at the Tower of Conviction. It was just for an instant, but I'm sure it was him. He must still be wandering around, alone somewhere in the night. But Guts's brand begins to bleed, and an attack comes. More of the crocodile creatures emerging from the ocean. One bursts in the door. Guts manages to take down a massive number of the creatures, but more come. Shriek is able to pin down where those who are controlling the monsters are casting their magic from, and sends Sir Pico, who decapitates them. And I, for some reason, really love that Sir Pico's, like, special power with this sword and cloak is that he can just decapitate large groups of people very easily. Like, that's just what he's consistently doing now. He's just the ultimate decapitator machine. Which something in my brain is kind of tickling me that, like, that was set up in his first duel with Guts where it kind of came down to a quick draw. And now we're seeing Sir Pico's, like, main form of attacking with this weapon to just be a surprise attack. Because even more so than Guts, he's a bit of a glass cannon. Like, that distance swipe sword is super powerful and I think great. But he's not able to take a level of damage of even close to like guts. And as we're about to see later in this deluxe edition, they get to have a little bit more of a showdown. Ooh. But a gigantic beast comes from the water. Shriek sees that it's not being controlled by someone on land, but instead off into the ocean, meaning Sir Pico can't take care of the caster. But Guts is able to take it down while struggling to maintain control in the berserker armor. The armor moves, consuming him. And after taking out the beast, he begins walking towards his own party, the berserker armor in control of his mind. Sir Pico steps up, coming between the party and Guts terrified that he's no longer in control. We see inside Guts' mind, the monsters tearing at his psyche. Shriek steps in, telling him, Not your enemies! Don't be afraid! And is able to shatter the control the Berserker armor has over Guts. Son of a In the end, it was just like he said. Shriek calls back to their conversation. Being so set in your own ways will make you old before your time, right? And we see Guts smile. Yeah. You're right. That wasn't the confrontation I was mentioning between Guts and Sir Pico, though. Just to keep the suspense up! But we notice in the commotion, the child has gone missing. It's all right. I'm sure he went home, Lady Farney says. Couldn't be, Guts thinks. From here, we cut to a Kushan boat out in the waters. We see a report is being given. Things would not go this smoothly using the army's crude methods. An entire peninsula of villages and outlying habitation fully subjugated within a single night and in secret. Not a single fire lit, not a single inhabitant remaining, not even a piece of flesh. But one thing worries me. The thoughts from one group of Harashada ceased. There should not be anyone in this land who can massacre the Pacha endowed by his majesty. No, there can't be. And we cut to our party walking along the beach. You didn't know Guts was on the beach, mother Sorry if we're booking it a bit quickly through this section, I just have a lot more to say about what is about to come. Because we see our party arrive at the united forces of the kingdoms coming together to fight the Kushan. We see Shriek is bothered and just how barbaric things are. Puck and Isidro, though, love this environment. Isidro saying, Yeah, gets the blood going! Sir Pico gives his rundown of the political standing between the different forces gathered. And I really love how continually Mira always in these scenes of dialogue remembers who has what strengths and can believably 
convey what information to the reader. And because a lot of them have different strengths of knowledge, it doesn't feel very unnecessarily exposition dumpy. Because yeah, I don't think Shriek would have an understanding of the political parties before, and it would be an important piece of information to know. And if Sir Pico didn't disseminate that information, I'd be like, dude, that could be valuable information when you're kind of wading into all this politics coming in as an outside party. So I don't know. I just think there's usually a great balance of that in Berserk. And continuing with the character continuity, we see Guts is, of course, having a lot of memories come back to him, being in a battlefield that reminds him where he spent so much of his younger years. We see a mercenary leader trying to hire local crews, to which Guts give a breakdown of mercenary life and culture. Sir Pico brings up Griffith, speaking of the Band of the Hawk and their incredible reputation. Isidro, as well, begins speaking about the reputation of the Hawk, specifically saying, the Band of the Hawks Riders Captain, what's his name? That guy was wicked strong. I meant he cut down something like a hundred, no, thousands opponents. And of course, he doesn't know that he's talking about Guts. And Guts calls back to when his previous opponent called himself a member of the Band of the Hawk. Shriek is stopped for her witch's garb, but she uses the odd to distract the guards, showing she can do minor mental manipulations. But they still decide they need to get her out of normal clothing. Isidro accidentally knocking her hat into the mud. Isidro doesn't understand why this would upset her so much until he is told that it was made and given to her by her mistress. Shriek runs off and Isidro is told to go get her back. Shriek sees some form of speed it in an alley, following it. She discovers hanged prisoners through magic, seeing their suffering before they died. Their ghosts, begging, let me, let me down, set me free. More guards come, asking Shriek who she is. She confronts them and uses magic to control them. The guards begin helping her cut down the bodies. We see Isidro is moving through the city, still trying to find Shriek. A young noble, one we recognize from working with Griffith, stops him. He overhears Isidro talking about a witch, saying, I beg your pardon. But might I hear more about that? We cut to Shriek, who has gone to the naval yard and is looking at one of the massive ships, thinking about how large and disgusting it is to her. This environment is eating at Shriek. Isidro, in his confrontation with the noble, jumps down a wall to get away. He tells Puck, We gotta find the witch before he does! We see Shriek sitting at the end of a dock, being surrounded by birds. And I can just say with 100% confidence, there's also a bunch of fish beneath her. Not just because there's always a bunch of fish beneath, like, a dock, but, like, I just feel like she's got some serious Disney princess vibes. Anytime she's just stationary, nature is going to come be around her and be like, Oh, the witch! Her elf warns her. Here somebody comes. Outstanding! Witches really do exist! And we see it's the young woman who serves Griffith. You're a witch, aren't you? Do I look like one? You bet! I mean, a pointed hat and a wand! That's a staff! And you're talking to animals! Besides, there's her! A girl with an elfin toe can only be a witch. You can see me? The young woman charmingly questioning Shriek. It sure is hard being different than others. And you? Are you of this place? I guess a lot's happened to me, too. See, to put it one way, once upon a time, there was an ugly duckling. Oh, I know that fairy tale. A duck? The ugly duckling was different from everyone else, so she was ostracized, you see. The ugly duckling was a swan. She was a kite. Huh? One day, a nasty murder of crows attacked the duck's pond. The meek ducks couldn't even fly away, so they just quacked in terror. Everyone was captured. The young kite was convinced she was just an odd duck and was also captured because she didn't know how to fly. I had to look this up. Kite doesn't mean kite. It's a type of bird. I don't know avian facts. Just then, it was the king of the birds who saved the ducks. He was a white hawk. The white hawk brought his servants the dragon and in the blink of an eye finished off the crows. Hawks and kites are something like kinsfolk. For the first time, the young kite met one of her own and realized she could fly. The white hawk rampaged around the kingdom, crusading against the murderous crows. Not only dragons, but ducks and even stray crows who had reformed followed the white hawk. The young kite was special. Only she could fly the same sky and feel the same wind as the hawk. Neither the wild dragons nor the frail ducks could do that. Then one day it happened. The duck princess, who had been captured by the crow king, was rescued by the hawk, and the timid ducks wanted the white hawk and the duck princess to mate so that they could have a strong tie to the hawk. The young kite was not amused. She was the only one who could fly in and feel the same sky as the hawk, but it didn't matter. Hey, I, uh, I feel like this went from a little quick fairy tale to TMI about what's going on with your relationship with Griffith. I think we're very deliberately also getting this nice juxtaposition between the rather wholesome crush that Shriek Gay, as my chat here on Twitch is letting me know it's pronounced, uh, has on guts and the rather twisted 
and uncomfortable relationship that Sonia, I think her name was said as, is developing with Griffith. Oh my god, it's terrifying. So the sullen young kite tried to distract herself by gazing at the sea. So what then? What then? Well, by the sea, the kite met a young owl from the forest who was surrounded by seagulls, Shriek points at herself. The kite thought, even though she's surrounded by so many seagulls, that owl looks lonely for some reason. We're kind of alike. Gazing at the same setting sun, maybe we can be friends, she thought. <laughs> The owl thought so too, Shriek says. We see Isidro is still asking about Shriek's location. Someone says that he saw her by the dock. So do you have anyone where you are who understands you? Uh, let me see. My companions are almost all ordinary people. So when it comes to magic users' feelings, and we see Shriek thinks of guts. I say it's love! It's nothing like that. It's just, he's an adult who paid attention to me, and I kind of enjoyed it a little, I guess. That is the most common thing to happen to little kids when an adult pays attention to them. You develop a crush. It's sweet and innocent, and Mira, please, for the love of God, don't make it weird. I remember the first crush I had on an adult when I was a kid was my first babysitter my parents hired for me. I thought she was like 30. I was like seven, I think, and she was like 14. <laughs> it's amazing how when you are like a child, Teenagers, you assume are all like, you have a 401k, right? Well, now that we've gazed at the sea and broadened our minds, we've got to go back, back to where those we care about are and those who care about us. Yes, we do, Shriek says. I just am in awe at the continual culty crazy vibe that is coming from Griffith's people that when you know and you know they're terrifying, but when you don't know, you're like, what a sweet little individual. Ah! But just then we see a bunch of Kushan children being chased by slavers who bought them. Shriek interjects saying, You will kindly curtail this display of indecency at once. The conflict quickly escalates and the children are abused by the men. The girl who serves Griffith saying, Oh bother, maybe this place burning down is not such a bad idea. And again, from like Shriek's perspective, she's like, yeah, these people are terrible. But from our perspective, we're like, no Shriek, she's being literal. But just as the man directly threats Shriek, a Cedaro arrives, throwing one of his stones. <laughs> hey, you pirates, quit breaking the law. Who are you? I'm with Mushroom Girl over there. I can't see a bunch of pirates gathering up all these kids for some picnic at sea. Ha, huh, what a disgrace. What'd you say, kid? If you're pirates, you should be kidnapping girlies who are more like boom, shoop, boom. That's why they call a treasure chest pirate booty. You guys are just gross. Isidro, everything you just said was tragically wrong. And I share in Shriek's visceral embarrassment, but it was said with such confidence that I still managed to somehow appreciate you in your absolute and total failure to throw any kind of resonating insult. But a fight begins, and Isidro is actually able to hold his own, drawing blood from one of the pirates, but this then escalates for them. With blood being drawn, if Isidro loses, this could be fatal. Shriek, using her telekinetic link, calls out to Guts for help. But just then, the noble who is following Isidro arrives. He, of course, recognizes the girl who also serves Griffith. When Shriek asks if he's the hawk, the girl says, no, no, he's my watchdog. Let's see. The Duck Knight. But the young knight helps fight off the slavers before a pirate captain comes down and joins the fray, looking exactly like Blackbeard. He's just gotta light that beard on fire and we're golden. But after doing some disgusting things to the men who are already wounded, he challenges the young noble to a fight. They fall into a rocking boat and the pirate is able to use the unstable footing to his advantage. Isidro joins the fray and actually is able to hold up on the unstable footing. The pirate is impressed with Isidro and actually asks him if he wants to join. Isidro rejects. Just as the pirate gets an advantage over Isidro though and is about to take him down, he steps on a sleeping knight who wakes up from the boat saying, withdraw. The pirate tries to step on the knight and the knight exclaims, I just told you to withdraw. Good grief. Just when I forget my hunger and fall asleep, who would denigrate the face of a knight? And I don't know who this guy is. He looks vaguely familiar. Maybe I should recognize him. All I know is his vibe I fuck with. Scoundrels, I will deal with you. A knight's intuition, justice is my heart, to act when the time arrives, that is to be a knight, no need for any words. And we see with a massive mace staff, he begins taking on the pirate crew. Who is the, I don't know who he is, but I love him. I love him immediately. Our party and the enslaved children managed to slip away and we see Guts was near enough by to intervene, but chose not to. Shriek sees that the young woman and noble are going to take the children with them. Well, it's not as if we can just abandon them. I don't want to smear mud on a fun memory. Besides, our leader's not so cheap a person that he complained over something like this. Right, fine. We'll take them to the band of, hey, Isidro interrupts. Isidro, if you hadn't said hey right there, 
whole trajectory for this story would be entirely different because they'd learn that that's the band of the hawk right now. That is just a small moment where it's like, oh, that is entirely going to send this narrative down another path. Fantastic. Well done, Isidoro. Isidoro teases the knight saying, you're the one who dropped his sword in the water. Lame. How can you become a knight that way? And you looked as shameful as an overturned frog. So did you. And you looked drunk stumbling around in the boat. So, Miss Witch, if you'd like to, why not come along with us? And we see Shriek, after seeing Guts in the distance, turns her down, saying, Thank you, but I have a place to go back to. And the girl turns, saying, So that man standing at the gate, he's the one then? And Shriek is immediately embarrassed. Fooey, you turned me down. Too bad. All right, I still haven't asked you your name. I'm Sonia. I'm Shriek. I'm Mavalria. Gonna be honest, I did forget everyone's name until that moment. Just being totally real with you. Except for Shriek's, of course. They turn back to the two boys fighting. Sonia saying, If you play too long, I'll leave you behind, mule. You too, Isidro. The young noble says, I'm mule. What's your name? Isidro. I'll remember that name, Isidro. Isidro. Isidro tries to say through swollen lips. And we see Sonia call back. Get away from this city as soon as you can. Huh? Shriek asks, seeing a flash of the city burning in piles of bodies. What was... Until we meet again, Owl of the Forest. Again, this isn't goodbye. The young owl and the young kite are sure to meet again. That wasn't ominous. At, at all. Not ominous, even a little bit there. And we see as Cedaro takes Puck and uses him to apologize to Shriek, saying, About the hat and clothes, sorry, and I'm sorry for being obstinate. Thank you for coming, Shriek says. And Shriek notices Guts walking away one last time. That night at the inn they're staying at, Shriek comes down wearing civilian clothes, needing to blend in more. The party is continually harassed by commoners, Guts having to resort to violence to end the harassment. We pick up in Griffith's encampment, seeing Princess Charlotte approach Griffith. Upon seeing him thinking, Almost like a painting. One cut from eternity, it feels like. Lord Griffith, we see Sonia call. Hey, hold on, the young noble tries to intervene. Here I am. Welcome back, Sonia. How was the sea? It was a lot of fun. I even made a neat friend, and we had a little adventure. Thanks to which I'm exhausted, the young noble says. Good work, mule. But Princess Charlotte approaches, saying, I Excuse me. Ah, Princess Charlotte, Griffith says. Lord Griffith, here, I bake some sweets if you wish. Everyone could. Sonia jumps forward. Wow, sweets! Let's have a look, see. Mmm, so good, a marvelous t- Hey, the noble says. Sonia offers Griffith one of the sweets, before offering one to Mule. Now look, it smells nice, Griffith says. Sweet. Somehow it sets the mouth at ease. I never dreamed I would encounter such a gentle taste on the battlefield. Thank you, Princess Charlotte. Oh, oh not at all. I'm happy, though, if it pleases you. Come here a minute. The young noble grabs Sonia. He pulls her away from Griffith. Lord Griffith is busy, and they hardly have any time to be alone together. If you're a woman, not to mention a medium who can sense people's thoughts, then empathize. How tormented must she have been by loneliness and anxiety, alone for years amongst the enemy. Now she finally gets her wish to be reunited with her lover. Sonia storms off, approaching one of Griffith's followers, the archer. They begin talking. She says... You're always by yourself. Aren't you lonely? I'm a hunter. I feel calmer alone. Hmm. Are hunters always alone? Do they walk alone in mountains and forests? There are those who are otherwise, but not me. I hunt alone. For days, I run through mountains and rivers, chasing my prey. I lurk alone deep in the forest. Through so many nights, I lose track of time. And then, and then, before I know it, I too have become a beast. And we see he lacks pupils. You know, I... I was alone too. I could see things other people couldn't, hear voices they couldn't. My world alone was different from theirs. I see. She wasn't the only one who was lonely and anxious. The young girl falls asleep, the hunter putting a cloak around her. A dream of kite and owl playing in the mountain forest. We pick back up with Shriek giving Lady Farnese a lesson in magic. Look closely, please, so as to burn the image into your mind. Slowly, close your eyes. Now imagine it. The image of the apple you just saw now. Shape, color, as much detail as you can. Not rushed, but slowly. It is no use. The image is blurred and will not take a firm shape. That is how it is at first. This is the first step to becoming a magic user. Now, I'm actually going to go into detail to what's said here because I feel like it's very important to like the actual setup for how the magic system is going to progress. So bear with me. Actually, no, we're not because I'm going to be doing a full Berserk lore deep dive after these videos are done and I don't want to do redundant information in my videos. So as a result, I will not be going over this detailed explanation of the magic system here. And instead, you can keep an eye out for that video coming down the road. From here, we see Isidoro and Sir Pico return saying they've been unable to secure passage on a ship to the Elf Island. Lady Farnese interjects, saying, Would you mind leaving this to me? What, Farney? You got some idea? 
Lady Fernice, Sir Pico says. You cannot mean. I will be gone for a bit, Sir Pico. I. He joins her as Lady Fernice straps on her sword. And here's one of my issues with YouTube. Nudity. Gonna always censor it in every Berserk video I do because, you know, meh. I personally don't find nudity abhorrent at all, but I know YouTube does. Here is just a marble statue that happens to be nude. I have to censor that even though within the context of the book, it's just art because I can't even talk to anybody even if it gets a false flag. Sorry, just needed to take a moment to go. Yeah. Here we see Lady Farnese's home within the city and her father dealing with some issues of the estate. He is told that he has a guest. It appears to be a lady dressed in male garb and her attendant. She entrusted this to me. It's Lady Farnese's sword. Her father says this is... The lady gives her name as Farnese Vendimion. What? Her father asks upon seeing her. Why have you come here? Farnese is too scared, unable to speak. I heard about the Holy Iron Chain Knights, that they were destroyed by a Kushan invasion while guarding Albion. I won't say that was your indiscretion, but figurehead or not, you were in charge of the Band of the Knights. For you alone to survive, shamelessly, and further go into hiding, by all rights, you deserve to appear before the Holy City's Supreme Court to receive judgment. It would seem that, no matter where you go, the star under which you were born will see to it that you sully the honor of our name, Van Dimion. Until I say otherwise, you are to abide quietly in this mansion. Yes, father. Lady Farnese, Sir Pico says. Lady Farnese turns. Father! Uh, I, friends, a ship. Her father turns, ignoring her. Lady Farnese, Sir Pico says. I do feel like I get being afraid of your parent. I get having that like, ah, reaction when they start disciplining you. But I feel like Lady Farnese has gone through enough growth to have a bit more backbone here than just totally crumbling, but... All right, it needs to happen, so what happens next? We see Lady Farnese is dressed in noblewoman garb. She goes to prevent her silver knife from being thrown away before her brother comes and says, Your behavior is unprecedented as ever, little sister. No wonder father's astounded. Magnifico, brother, how long it's been. We've not seen each other in years since before you were sent to the Covenant. Have you met with our older brothers? No, the Vendemians aren't very tightly knit. But much regarding you has reached my ears. Your work with the Holy Iron Chain Knights and the unfortunate troubles that followed. Lady Farnese doesn't respond, and we see that her brother has a proposition for her, commenting on how neglectful their father was, referring to Lady Farnese as a devil child, before saying of their father, That bastard thinks of his family as nothing more than cogs in a giant machine called Vendemion. Inferior products that don't meet his approval are cast off without hesitation or any show of concern just as if they were stones by the wayside. So, what brings you here? The way her brother here is trying to position himself as being on her side, but also still kind of just being terrible. After Lady Fernice tells him what he needs, the brother says, a single ship that would not be beyond my power, but in return, I have a request to make my sister. A request? And we cut back to the party in the inn. Sir Pico coming upstairs, avoiding making eye contact before saying, Lady Farnese will not be rejoining you. Farney? She's not coming back? What's up with that, Sir Pico? Who's gonna look after Casca? Take this. If you show this letter to any traders in the city, you should be able to acquire a ship, as many sailors as you need. Please do not open the seal. And I love that we see your Cidero trying to look into the tube. I did that when I was a kid too. It does not work even a little bit. I am returning these borrowed items. And we see it's Lady Farnese's gear. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Vendemian family, I offer the sincerest gratitude for safely returning the head of the family's daughter, Farnese du Vendemian, to this palace. It amounts to little, but our Vendemian bank shall shoulder the burden of any and all expenditures your group incurs while in this city. Again, I extend our formal thanks. Now buy your leave. Wait, Sir Pico, please. Hey, Gut says at the top of the stairs. It struck me here yet again how just naturally intimidating Guts is. I know he's not about to attack Sir Pico yet, but just seeing him stand up there and saying like, hey, you know Sir Pico's gonna stop, because if he keeps walking, Guts will stop you. There's no harm in at least telling us the reason, is there? There is nothing for me to say on this matter. Guts pauses before saying, I wanted to try having a fight with you again. That motivation no longer exists, Sir Pico responds before leaving. So what now? It, it is no use. Her mind is closed, or rather, it seems that Fernice has untied my hair. Now thought transference will not reach her. What gives? We all cheated death together so much, and in the end, it's a scrap of paper and have a nice life? This is why I can't stand aristocrats. There are some circumstances they cannot discuss. When I touched Sir Pico's hand for an instant, a vision of Fernice's sad face came across in Sir Pico's perplexity. This is just so odd. 
Bernice was so zealous about studying magic and taking care of Costca. So to suddenly do this... This definitely doesn't seem right, Gut says. Hey, short stuffs. I've got a favor to ask. It's an elf-only job. And we see the elves are sent to spy on the mansion. They watch as Lady Farnese meets with her brother and a suitor for Farnese, and now her fiancé, Roderick Stauffen. Stauffen. Stauffen? Sh Greet him. He's your fiancé. And we see an incredibly stilted greeting happens between the two. And Roderick compliments Lady Farnese, giving her a great gift and saying, Well, you make quite the picture surrounded by roses. And he does this with his fingers. I... It... Okay. I... Just, we've had evolution referenced, we've had Puck turn into Yoda, and now someone who's not even an elf is looking at Lady Fernice and doing this with their fingers, which, I'm sorry, but I have no way of checking this, but wasn't that a thing that only came around once, like, photography was a- Is there photography in here? What? Maybe not. Maybe people have been doing this since, like, the cave painting days and are like, oh yeah, that's a really- but it just seems odd. Mura is just very willing to be like, ah, I need a way to explain and convey this idea. So modern reference. He continues to be somewhat charming and her brother definitely gives off the worst vibe in the scene. The elves say, you know what this is? It's a scandal. Time's a wasting. We're out of here. We gotta let everyone know. Sir Pico sees the two elves flying off. They report back to the group, letting him know what they saw. While they're discussing what to do, Guts is back in bed, still struggling with his fever. He manages to contribute as collateral for his ship an engagement was suggested to her, or something like that. Our aristocrat political marriages are pretty much a matter of course, especially for her, a daughter of nobles, with such high reputation. I completely forgot about that. I don't blame you. That's not a fear I think most people should just like keep in their back pocket ready to go. Like, oh, quickly do this mission. Don't. Don't get engaged though. There's probably people out there who are proposed to everywhere they go. I don't know what lives people live. Continue on. Guts seems to reject this idea though, sitting up from bed saying, if the price for a ship is Casca's babysitter and good food, it ain't much of a deal. And I know, I know Guts, you little stinker. You're putting forth this like, it's just not worth the trade. Let's go get her back. But in reality, Guts doesn't want to lose Lady Farnese. He likes her as a friend and I refuse to believe otherwise. We see Lady Farnese attempting magic still on a bench in her manner. Lady Farnese is already showing signs of regret for her decision saying, by doing something nobody but I could do, I wanted to be helpful to all of them, but I'm sure that was an excuse. I was unable to stay there at that fireside circle of light given to me so unexpectedly. There was warmth, yet I could offer it nothing in return. The warmer it got, the more I thought I might have a place there, but I couldn't stay. And in my anxiety, I ran back home, here where I'm accustomed, cold and enclosed. I'm a coward and a fool, Lady Farnese, Sir Pico says. And this, again, character moment. Lady Farnese has struggled with anxiety and uncertainty, and as someone who has had their entire worldview changed, actually, yeah, I take back what I said. It is kind of believable that, especially thrown back into their home environment again, they might regress massively, but after they're over the shock of the moment, that regression would become a just regret. And I actually really like this beat for her character, because it is showing the strength she has evolved to, after she has that regret build, be like, oh, wait, this might not be the right move, and now I feel like a coward. But just then her mother arrives. So, Farnese. I don't know why I thought this. Thought Lady Farnese's mother was dead. We see Lady Farnese's mother learns of the engagement and the deal that's been struck. When her mother asks, do you have any man whom you're fond? Meaning like, is there anyone you'd marry for love? Lady Farnese strangely thinks of guts briefly, but then thinks, no, to me he's... She pauses. And I'm glad that she's like undercutting that, but I still think it's weird Guts would even pop into her mind. She's had like no romantic interest in Guts and the only physical attraction was in moments where she was like possessed, right? Anyway. Noticing her hesitation, her mother says, you're out of sorts somehow. You don't seem like that daughter who had the head of the Venemian family at a loss, but I never, oh, you didn't know? Your father fears you, huh? You see, he's weak. Father is him? Yes, he's weak, so he wants everything situated where he can handle it. He moves people and things all throughout the world like they were toys, and once everything is arranged according to his own schemes, he finally relaxes. In my eyes, he is a slave to the world. Well, I suppose if he wasn't so abnormal, he wouldn't be cut out to be the head of the Minion family. So to someone like him, you're an enigma, a little monster. I am? To father? That, that cannot be. I could never say one word to father about my own feelings. I never could do more than 
nod at whatever he said, never. The use of words is not all there is to communicating feelings, Farnese. Yeah, you burned down the house. <laughs> You've always expressed your unutterable repressed feelings through the most unexpected behavior, like a baby without speech crying and shouting for all it's worth. Okay, Mrs. I Understand Feelings Exposition Dump. Being the mother actually kind of makes sense. I've had my own mom kind of go on a monologue where she's like, this is why you behave that way. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so it is coming across a little bit like state it for the growth that Farnese needs to go through, but of like every character to do it, her own mother is a good way for it to be done. You were raised all alone, like some beast of the field, never experiencing a parent's warmth or the world of man. And so your heart is naked, not clad in any shell. When it comes to your feelings, you are artistic, so much that you cannot abide this world. That is, I'm not gonna lie, I like Lady Farnese, still a pretty charitable way to put that. <laughs> You burned down our house. You're quite artistic with your feelings. <laughs> but you know, if you were able to find a place for yourself somewhere, then you, more familiar with pain than most, could probably come to be kinder than anyone else. Mother, I don't exactly remember raising you per se, but as a mother, I'm proud to have a daughter like you. Perhaps you had me as a bad example from which to learn. They're interrupted by someone letting me know a coach has been prepared. There's a ball they must attend. Farnese's mother asks her to come. We cut back to the party trying to get into the palace, seeing it surrounded by a wall. They see a carriage leaving with Lady Farnese inside and follow it to the ball. We see tension among the nobles is already rising, as the invasion of the Kushan has all ruling houses on edge. Lady Farnese arrives and sees her brother and fiance. He asks her for a dance to which she accepts. Farnese's mother confronts her brother, saying she knows of the plan, stating, You've gradually become more and more like your father in his youth. Hardly. Please stop teasing. Listen to some advice. She rolls over him. Be careful of her when she's obeying what someone says, especially when she seems submissive. She's not the kind of woman who's at peace within the schemes of men. What are you trying to? You'll be sorry if you don't listen, just like your father. Sir Pico was watching Lady Farnese dance before Lady Vanmion asked him, You're Lady Farnese's servant. I am Sir Pico, madam. Yes, I remember now. It's been some time since you came to the estate. It's been over 10 years. My life was saved by Lady Farnese at a young age. Due to that, I received the honor of being at her side. More than a decade alongside Farnese, really. And you must be fairly warped as well. Such companions cannot be separated because they cannot stand without entwining against each other, just like a pair of trees. You will continue to look after her then. She is quite astute, Sir Pico thinks. Yeah, kinda. We see Shriek uses her odd to manipulate soldiers, allowing them into the palace. But before they get too far, fog rolls in and a commotion behind them. They see a beast had murdered the guards walking through the fog. But as it sees them, it turns and walks away. That's too big for an alley cat, Isidoro says. It's strange, Guts observes. You think something like that would come to attack us? Yeah, it just ran past. But if something like that slipped in here, we'd better hurry. Guts is on edge, seemingly well aware of something's about to happen. Shriek gets a thought transference from Sir Pico. He said he's waiting at the rear entrance. They go to meet him. Sir Pico? He's standing in a room filled with columns. Colonnade Chamber was at one point in history Kushan territory. When this land was won back from them, it seems one part of their palace was preserved as a victory monument. I apologize for calling you over here. Sir Pico, we've come to see far- Sir Pico draws a sword. That is unfortunate as I will not allow it to happen. Guts, this is presumptuous, but I will grant your wish right here and now. You're gonna fight with Guts here, Sir Pico? Fine, Guts draws his sword. Guts, not you too. Something we can't let go of, I guess. You guys stay there until this is settled and we see the fight between them commences. Sir Pico having drawn Guts into the columns to try and debilitate his sword. But my favorite thing about this fight, uh, Guts just destroys the fucking columns. <laughs> he just takes his massive sword and clears a large enough area that he can then fight uninhibited and then he beats Sir Pico because fucking duh. And it's hammered home a couple different times in this fight that it's not cheating for Sir Pico to choose this room as a fight. It's strategic. I would call that cheating. Like, I'm sorry, if you challenge someone to a duel, it needs to be equal footing. That's my personal take as a not swordsman. Actually, no, I fenced for a while. I'm a swordsman. I was 13, but still, I, I would, I would take on guts. But as the roof begins crumbling from above due to all the columns being torn down, Sir Pico is pinned beneath it. Guts with the flat of his blade hovering above him. I never thought you'd use the crumbling pillar against me. Did you read my intent? Sir Pico says, bleeding from his head. No, it happened by chance. Guts responds. Then once again, with you and your reflexes, Shriek is upset, tears in her eyes. I will never let anything like that happen. Never. And I, again, character, continuity, and moments 
Shriek is still a kid. And yeah, if you're an adult watching this fight, you know Sir Pico and Guts aren't going to just straight up murder each other. That wasn't their intent. But for a child, it's still really traumatic to see two people you care about fight. I remember seeing adults fight when I was a child, and it always terrified me. Sir Pico sits up saying, Guts, when you see Farnese, then what do you intend to do? I don't know, but I'll see her. That's for sure, Guts says. You really do tend to play it by ear. That's the beauty of Guts. He's walking into literally a room filled with all of these noble heads, and he's about to be like, we'll just see what happens. Isidoro stops Guts saying, hey, was that for real just now? Yeah, Guts says. Yeah, but at the end, you must have, that was luck. He's not so weak that I can go easy on him. And I do think like Guts was really fighting him in the sense of like an MMA fight, but he wasn't trying to kill Sir Pico. Tell me if you disagree in the comments down below, but I don't think Guts was intending to actually kill Sir Pico. And then just like lucked out they got taken out by rubble. He wasn't going to cut him in half, right? We were definitely serious, Sir Pico added, but Guts had agreed to attack the condition. Condition? I challenged him to a duel by the sword, and despite the disadvantage he may have had, he would answer by the sword. Maybe he could be deemed honest to a fault in swearing not to use his projectiles, much less that cannon. Well, for my part, I did take advantage of that. And more than anything, he did not unleash the power of his armor. Perhaps I simply lacked the power to drive Guts that far, or else. Guts says, that monster's got me worried. Don't linger behind or I'll leave you. They tell Sir Pico of the monster they saw. Guts adds, pretty soon this city is going to become a battlefield. Shriek remembers Sonya saying, get away from the city as soon as you can. If, as you say, that monster's the Kushan Vanguard, I dare say it's headed where the most important people are gathered. Farnese is in danger, Sir Pico says. Let us go. I will guide you there. And Sir Pico, um, Shriek hands him back his cloak and sword. We cut to the noble ball, seeing Lord Van Dimion come into the room. His praises are sung as he says, Supreme Councils and City Administrators of the Vertanus, I am honored that you have accepted my invitation this evening. Tomorrow, we'll surely see the start of a holy war, one involving a military host unprecedented, even in the history of the Holy See's domain. You degenerates fr Oh, did- <laughs> Dignitaries. You dignitaries from myriad nations will feel akin to mighty heroes. However, this is your last banquet before departing for the front. So let us tonight discuss nothing so inelegant. We see Farnese's brother say, Roderick, once father's done speaking, we move. A toast and celebration of victory. Good people gathered here, Magnifico says. I would like to take this opportunity to impart an announcement regarding our Vendemian family. Who's that? The third Vendemian son, I believe. Magnifico? See, these two standing here, third in line to the royal throne of Ithith, Roderick of Shrufen, and my si- And we see Magnifico hesitate. Magnifico. F father what's this all about? Well, uh, y you see- Just then, the fog rolls in thick. A monster is seen through a window before crashing into the room. The lights go out. The room is in darkness. No one knows what's going on. Waiter, fetch a light! People were injured! Blood on my forehead's cut! A commotion is heard as a light is brought in people see the gore before them as a gargantuan tiger-like demon stands among them. First of all, once again, monster design. Oh! This is like if the Jesher cat was mixed with a tiger and turned into a nightmare. Oh my god! But also that beat of like, oh, what's this commotion? Some people are injured. It's totally dark. We can't really see. Bring in the light. <laughs> it seems a slaughter is about to begin as the heads of the noble families will be butchered by an assassination attempt from the Kushan. But Lady Farnese manages to step forward in the massacre, remembering that silver is a weakness to these creatures, and she stabs it with a candelabra in the eye. Many witness her heroism before Sir Pico arrives, removing her from harm's way. Guts enters the ballroom, saying, looks like the party's in full swing. I love that every now and then, Guts just gets 80s action hero lines that are just totally unabashedly 80 action hero lines. You might as well like chamber around while saying it. It's so funny. It's just part of the personality that makes him a lot more than just like your typical stoic badass where he's like, he got some corny bars in them. The nobles gathered, of course, make comments about the size of Guts' sword, and as he kills the demon among them, they're frozen in awe. Such splendid kill! No doubt you must be a knight of renown, but of what army? It ain't over yet, and we see several more of the demons jump through the windows. The nobles are pushed away to a clear distance. Guts is about to leave, but Lady Farnese says, Wait, wait a minute, please! All my relatives are here in this place, please! And Guts straight up 
cold-heartedly was about to leave and be like, yeah, all right, I'm done. See ya, let's get Lady Farnese out. But she's like, no, no, guts, come on. Like, don't let this entire war be decided right now. Like, if he walked away, the Kushan wipe out the entire leadership for this army gathered to stop them in one blow. But Lady Farnese single-handedly stops this war from just crumbling by being like, guts, 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 guts. Do your thing. This has happened like several times throughout recent sections of Berserk. And as I noted earlier, just small decisions that as a reader, if you take a moment to think about them, just have gargantuan ramifications. And usually moments like this within the fantasy books I read, there'll be like a little more emphasis, but a lot of them are pretty just subtle and like, oh yeah, Guts is gonna leave. No, 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 come on, do your thing. And we even see Shriek say, come now Guts, that is too cold. Whatever the case, I think it would be cruel to leave this many people and run. All right. Talk about charity, Shriek, if you would. I know. She reaches out, finding where the Kushan priests who are controlling these monsters are. The footbridge, east of the palace. Sir Pico heads off. Just gonna go do his decapitation thing again, which we see he absolutely does do. But before then, Gus starts massacring the tiger demons. And I now get to say something I'm so happy I get to say, and no one can be mad because it is absolutely technically correct to what is happening on the page. Guts is massacring some pussy. The nobles continue to be amazed as Guts is just slaughtering the demons, Isidoro providing support where he can. Shriek as well uses some of her magic to save noble lives, before giving a ring to Lady Farnese saying, it's a ring braided with the same vine as the little ones. You are the mistress of the thorn snakes. I am? It's all right. You can handle them at your level. And we see Lady Farnese is now able to control the magic contraption. Shriek unleashed. Lady Farnese's fiance, Roderick, comes forward and joins the fight. You know Farnese then, do you? Take a hike. This isn't safe for amateurs. Can't have you saying that now. Not in front of my beloved. I... I can't wait for this guy to die. It's berserk. I know he's going to get fucking brutalized and... Yay! Here's my prediction. I want him to have like a hand and jaw, hand up top, pulled in two. And because it's berserk, it's not like just his jaw pulled off, like what would happen. But instead it for some reason just like goes through his entire body and he's just severed in half. I maybe have read too much Berserk recently. But he takes advice from Lady Farnese and throws down his sword and uses a silver candelabra to finish off the beast. But at this point is where Sir Pico is able to find the men controlling the demons and he decapitates the lot of them. The rest of the demons are finished off. Guts says to Lady Farnese, your immediate family's here. It's the aristocrat world you know. Is this the last stop in your journey? No. Within this cage of stone, I finally realized this isn't the place to which I wish to return. It's simply where my journey began long ago. I just missed it and wanted to visit again, that's all. But the crown begins to question who exactly Guts is, as well as the display of magic they just saw. Some are beginning to speak of the magic they saw Lady Farnese use. What sort of journey has she been on, her mother thinks. Look how much trust you put in another person. Not once did I ever see that within the mansion. Not for me, him, and your brothers. For us, Minimions, such a thing could never exist. No one ever paid you any heed, and being raised in solitude, you won it through the power of your desire. A blessing that only a little soul and disregard of her familiar yoke could bring about. I'm a little envious. Guards begin entering the room. What shall we do now? Sir Pico asks. This is getting complicated, Guts says. Wait, Lord Midian says. Father? First, on behalf of everyone here, I must offer my gratitude to you people for putting an end to this mayhem. Oh, they're clapping. Which is Cedaro loves. It hardly seems false to me to deem these ugly creatures war beasts sent by the Kushan in a scheme to take advantage of this party and murder the personages of each nation. I have heard they are savages who prefer to use beasts in battle. Perhaps these were born of some secret art of crossbreeding or drug use. Uh, yes, that makes sense. Is he right? The Cedar asks. I think he's about half right, Shriek says. Also, the actions your daughter displayed. Well, I find terribly hard to say, but indeed, they could only be magic, a noble says. Your silence, everyone, Lord Vinimian insists. That was most likely mere illusion. Someone's trying to get away with their daughter having some little bit of extra special treatment because someone would normally burn people at the stake. Is this the closest thing Lady Farnese is ever gonna get as love from her father? Sadly, yes. Perhaps the wine we drank was drugged, or perhaps it was spread via this fog. It is probably a kind of mass hallucination. In any event, it is the aim of the Kushan army to strike at the heads of the Holy Seed domain and throw our allied army into confusion. To fall so easily for such a transparent tactic is the height of folly. It is disgraceful behavior for an adherent. Or do all of you gathered here intend on the night before deployment to go around trumpeting about elves and monsters? 
thus becoming the laughing stock of the soldiers. Indeed. Your old man sure is tough, Gus says. Yes. I think so too. And we see Lady Farnese's mother thinks, all this reality is thrust before him, and as ever, he employs shock and awe. He is truly out of Magnifico's league. What a weird thing for her to be like, my husband's awesome. Son's an idiot though. But just then, my least favorite beat of this deluxe edition happens. Not horrible, but something that feels a bit odd, because we see the fog face of the leader of the Kushan fill the room. Illusion, you say? Apostle, Guts thinks. Hear me. I am the Emperor Ganishka of the Great Kushan Empire. I have come to this place to declare a proclamation of war against you infidels. Those illusions you saw know this, that they are the start of a nightmare without end this evening. An apostle? And he's a ruler? Is he another of his followers? Does that mean he's involved with this war? And Guts thinks back to his conversation with Sir Spooky. Shriek points out, the sky's red, a fire. Someone points out that the sky's red, a fire in the harbor. Guts states, the damn thing's begun, and a siege on the city commences. We see soldiers being deployed as chaos takes hold in the city. More of the alligator soldiers emerging from the waterways. And I will say, they were saying like, what a disgraceful attack from our enemies. Totally the tactics I would use if I was the Kushan. I'm just gonna say, like, all's fair in war, right? If I heard all the enemies were being gathered in one place and I had some supernatural ways to attack it, if the only mistake they made, I would have sent a hell of a lot more than just these tiger guys. But we see many of the creatures that serve as soldiers in the Kushan Empire also begin emerging within the city, coming from the docks. Roderick steps forwards to the party and says, I've heard most of the situation from Farnese's brother. You're looking for a ship? What's your destination? I might be of service. Don't. Make me like you before you die. Don't you do it. I, mm -mm, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hate you and I'm gonna enjoy your death. They tell them their destination. And he says, Skelking Island, I've heard of it. At some port city at sea to the west, if I recall. Why not? I'll take all of you there on my ship. Whoa, man, really? But my ship is a warship and a trip at sea will be a bit rough on women and children. If you still wish to go, you're exactly what we need, Gut says. Indeed, Sir Pico compliments. But are you sure? Lady Farnese asks. A war is about to begin. I just came here to deliver his majesty's signed letter. My work is done. Ith may be in the same religious sphere, but it's of a different sect. We've no obligation nor interest in shedding blood for the people here. Roderick, you're getting carried away again. Well, why not? Look what happened to that plan of yours. But I don't feel like tossing out the engagement to you. I'd like to display some of my better qualities as a fiance. And he approaches Guts. I'm Roderick. Nice to meet you. I'm Guts. Likewise and thanks. Here is my exact prediction for what's about to happen. This guy is thinking, I'm gonna endear myself to this party, they'll let me join up and I get to marry the beautiful Lady Farnese. How great. And Guts is thinking this is not gonna be much of a problem because either he's gonna see the nightmares we're fighting and run, though he did okay against some of the lesser nightmares, or he'll die before this whole engagement thing becomes a real issue and I don't care. Fortunately, I'm anchored outside the harbor, but we can't have the ship burning down before we set sail. What about you, Magnifico? If you're going back, I'll give you a ride. It's obvious I'll be censured if I stay here in Verantis. I'll go away for now, until things calm down, and we see Fernice's father is taking command, ignoring her departure. Her mother thinks looking after her, though. Good journey to you, Farnese. Okay, remember when I used to be so harsh on Lady Farnese about how absolutely insane she was? I still think crazy lady who burned a bunch of people, definitely on a path to redemption that I'm on her side with, and with this added angle of her family dynamic, I'm just gonna say I get it. She's awful in a lot of the things she's done, straight up nightmares, but her life sucked. But as Lady Farnese is changing into more appropriate clothes for travel, someone approaches Guts. Are you, by chance, the Raiders captain of the Band of the Hawk? I'm Owen, former leader of the Midlands Tomel Knights. Your appearance is considerably different, but I'm sure I remember you. I saw you several times at the battlefield, abreast the White Hawk. You rode a young swordsman with a large sword on his back and eyes like a beast. Captain of the Hawk Riders, your name, let it go. It's history now. We're in the middle of things, so I must ask something. The Hawk, where is Sir Griffith currently? I don't know, but I wish I, no. Guts walks away. Take care, you might be closer than you realize. The party asks Guts, someone you know? Who's he? I guess I looked like somebody that he used to know. Now you're just somebody that I used to know! And we see that the man who recognized Guts is actually like hopeful that this means Griffith will come and save them. And it's just a continual reminder of the very interesting and wow position the main antagonist is set to be in during this invasion. I love this dynamic so much and I've only ever seen something like it like maybe once before. 
fascinating. But from here we cut to the encampment of His Holiness, and we see many members high within the church discussing, His Holiness is quite old. This may very well be his last outing. It grows increasingly urgent that we call together the court supreme and choose a candidate for the next pontiff. Perhaps the most prominent is, after all, Cardinal Plaziano. Quite a bit of groundwork is already laid. He seems quite liberal, and in temperaments haunts him. But we cut to the agile holiness, old and frail in bed, thinking, All those years that brought me to this age, this thought that would never finally disappear, that I have continually chanted in my mind like a curse, that this world is worthless, and that, more than anything, I am worthless. And we see that he has lived a cushioned life, and has rarely been more than much of a puppet as the head of the church, even saying, Never have I offered up prayer from my own heart. That's right. That's because I've never once harbored a wish for others, or for myself, that was worth praying for. Some pontiff I turned out to be. But now, enough. This vacant, tedious, idle lifetime will now end. There was no love, hatred, nothing. In the end, the divine hand of destiny was never held out to me. It was all a waste of time. Nothing but a stale chill. But once, just once, and just then we see the wing of the hawk consume his vision. Is that? What are you? Has the... Has it been held out to me too? The divine hand of destiny. And we see a thought transference coming to him. That was a dream, but no. I still feel something within this hand. Halt. Who are you? Children, what do you want at this hour? We have been entrusted with a message for His Holiness the Pontiff. Message? The Pontiff is here, is he not? Come now, that's rude. His Holiness has only just now retired. If it's a message, we will relay it. Tell us. Um, if you would grasp destiny in your hand, follow the guidance of the feathers of light, I think? What nonsense. Enough. Go home. I don't mind. Show them inside. But Holiness, it will harm your... You heard what he said. And we see the representatives of Griffith are let in. They bow before him, Mule saying, We humbly beg your pardon for suddenly calling on you at night this way. We have come here with orders to bring your holiness back to our lord. You too aren't messengers from Vertanus? No, sir. But they are not received well, and just they are about to be thrown out, the holiness interjects, Nay, as they have said, let's depart immediately. Holiness, I forbid anyone to contradict me at all on this matter. It's my holy command as pontiff. What in the world has come over you? Reporting urgent news has just arrived. Britannus has fallen under a surprise Kushan attack and is now in a state of combat. It is requested that His Holiness the Pontiff remain in this place and under no circumstances approach the city. The holy signs are coming together. It's like they're pointing out the path of destiny. Who knew that only now, when my flame of life is truly close to going out, would my life be given meaning? Now lead me where you will, guides of the feathers of light. There's been a divine revelation. I need everyone to shut up and appreciate how jaw-droppingly, stupefyingly brilliant Griffith is being set up as a villain whose presence permeates the page consistently, even when he hasn't been shown in like 400 pages. Shout out to Godochi who downloaded like all of these panels for me while I was editing live on Twitch with y'all. Very much so appreciated. But okay, let's look at what Griffith is accomplishing here and what exactly he represents. Because because this popey figure in just a few pages has been shown for us to be an insecure, flawed man who expected more during his time as a holy regent. Holy regent is like a term, right? He's sitting here on his deathbed like, I never found purpose. There is nothing special about this. Mer. He's a perfect victim in just these couple pages with admittedly a bit of too immediate setup and payoff for Griffith to take advantage of them. Because Griffith is a false Christ figure in this world. And humans, oh, we love being told we're special and oh, it's time for us to get all up in that holy purpose and we're better than everyone who came before. And this is where the brilliance of this comes in. If there is one person who represents perfectly to me, a prime, realistic, real-world example of someone Griffith could just leap on into and pluck right up like a little fruit and go, oh, oh, oh this will do nicely. <laughs> it's this guy. It's a small scene, but I feel like it's going to be very important later on because this is, in my opinion, in the massive amount of buildup we've been seeing for Griffith as a villain, the accumulation to the exact position and purpose he is supposed to have as a villain. And if you want your villain to feel dangerous, if you want them to feel conniving and beyond what a hero can handle, show them able to manipulate and position people 
perfectly with just their followers while they're not in the room, yet you as a reader can undeniably feel their hand maneuvering the pieces in to place. Griffith might be the most intimidating villain in fantasy I have ever read, not from a power perspective, but in how we're watching his game play out. It's like a combination of Sauron and Nurse Ratchet. I love it! But we see the city's forces are struggling against the enhanced Kushan forces. Guts arrives at a faltering army, clear the Kushan forces, before moving on towards the boat they need to flee. Seeing magic openly displayed, Farnese's brother is far more hesitant than Roderick to move forward, but he still does. The city in flames, the party continues their way, Shriek thinking of the girl who gave her the warning. Just then, another of the massive creatures with a trunk bursts through the wall before Guts, with more Kushan monsters riding the tiger demons in the battle. Guts says, you take the small ones, I'll kill the big one, and the party together once again is able to fend off the attacking riders as Guts takes down the massive beast, not even needing to resort to the Berserker armor for victory, jumping down from a cleverly set up sneak attack to successfully kill the monster. Just as Guts joins the fight with his party against the rest of the army, he notes, we ain't got time for this, the ship's gotta burn, we gotta wrap this up quick. And that is where you're wrapping up Berserk Deluxe Edition 10. Not next week, unfortunately, because I'll be out of town, but the week after, we will be doing all of Deluxe Edition 11 before then moving on to Deluxe Edition 12. And from there, I need to figure out how exactly to get the books that I need. I haven't ever bought a manga that's like not just in like the deluxe editions that you get handed and stuff. Hopefully there's like an online subscription I could use. But thank you everyone for showing on up for this gargantuan sized Berserk read along. I hope it makes up for missing a couple weeks in the past and like, and subscribe if you have not already. Go ahead and check out my books or in go ahead and check out my books or stay tuned and keep an ear on the channel for news about my upcoming book. And I love y'all. Thank you so much for supporting me and have a good one. Peace.